Welcome, everyone. We will begin the webinar, Hazardous Waste Disposal and Enforcement. I'm Melissa Joles with RDA Impact, and Brandon Thomas, Chief Operating Officer for GMG EnviroSafe, is your presenter today. The presentation will take approximately 30 to 35 minutes, and we are recording it, and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen, and Brandon will answer those at the end of the presentation. Now, I'll turn it over to Brandon. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your busy days to learn more about hazardous waste disposal and everything that that entails. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover in a little bit of time, and I know this is the week before the holiday, so you guys have plenty to do uh, in your facilities as you prep for that. So I'll jump right into it. Before we uh, talk about the actual content, uh, I do think it's important that the audience understand a little bit about my background uh, and where I'm coming from. Um, I am not a former regulatory inspector. I, don't, I, I didn't work for OSHA or the EPA. Uh, I am not an industrial hygienist or a scientist or a chemist. Um, I used to operate a multi-site um, operator uh, in Chicago that had 30 body shops, um, and I did that for about five years. So prior to becoming involved with GMG and VirusSafe, I was in a role just like you. And so everything that I'm going to present to you today dealing with regulatory compliance and hazardous waste disposal is from the lens of taking the regulations and distilling them down to concrete, specific tasks and things that you can do uh, to implement at your shops to make sure that you're protecting your businesses and you have some peace of mind. Um, I've been working with GMG and VirusSafe now um, as their president and CEO uh, for uh, the last two years. Prior to that, as Melissa said, I was the uh, chief operating officer uh, for a total of five. So I've been with GMG now for a little bit over seven years. GMG as a company, however, has been uh, providing EPA, OSHA, and DOT compliance uh, to the collision repair industry specifically uh, for nearly 30 years. Uh, we help shops set up their employee safety programs, handle their risk management, and service the United States nationwide. If you're on this call, I am assuming uh, that you have heard in the trade press or around the industry about some very significant penalties that have happened um, in the collision repair industry dealing with hazardous waste disposal. Um, the most recent that comes to mind was the announced settlement from about three or four months ago involving Cook's Collision, uh, which is an MSO uh, based in California, that settled the, uh, for $1.53 million uh, with the district attorneys in California, specifically dealing with disposal of non-empty chemical containers, shop dust, and treatment. Um, now, each of those I'm going to break down and we're going to talk about throughout this presentation. Um, and we've actually seen similar issues involving other organizations out there that have even larger penalties. O'Reilly Auto Parts, about a year and a half ago, uh, settled for $9.87 million dealing with used oil, oil filters, and aerosol cans. And AutoNation had a settlement two or three years ago for nearly $3.5 million uh, dealing with similar issues, but also electronics. And what you could see from this is the dollar amounts can add up very, very quickly. Um, and the reason for that is if a facility is illegally or improperly disposing of a hazardous waste into just regular trash, you know, and that's known as solid waste. So just what you're putting into your dumpsters and it's ending up in a landfill. If a facility is doing that, the penalties can climb to nearly $30,000 for each container. And then they can multiply it by the number of times that dumpster has been picked up and then if you do operate more than one facility, it can be multiplied by the number of locations. And that's where we see these multi-million dollar penalties. So the key thing here, though, is when I talk to shops, sometimes they get feedback of, well, this is in California. Cook's Collision was in California. My facility is in Texas, or it's in Illinois, or it's in Florida. So I don't have to worry about these things. And the stuff that I'm going to be presenting to you today uh, and what I've called out as a part of these disposal issues that resulted in these dollar amounts and these significant penalties all apply to every shop that's going to be on the call. So outside of California, we have the EPA regulating hazardous waste under what's known as RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. So everything I'm going to talk about is going to apply to any facility anywhere in the United States. It's not just a California issue. 
So the first thing that I want to jump in on, uh, which has probably been the most confusing for shops uh, that have tried to um, get their arms around their hazardous waste, is this idea of chemical containers. And when we're talking about containers, I'm talking about um, the cans themselves that your primer, base coat, and clear coat are coming in. Um, it, it's also the, the, the plastic liners that might be being used for a disposable paint system like PPS or RPS. Um, it might be mixing cups, basically things that once held some type of hazardous material. What are you doing with those containers after you've finished using them? And the important thing to remember as we walk through this step by step is that a container in and of itself is not inherently hazardous. We've seen a lot of shops that have seen the press releases coming out about chemical container disposal have taken the steps to just handle all of their paint liners and all of their paint cans as a hazardous waste. So they're setting up a 55 gallon drum and they're just putting everything in there. It fills up very quickly and they're spending a tremendous amount of money to dispose of those containers as hazardous. But, the container itself isn't inherently hazardous as long as we're following a couple of key rules. And what we want to stay focused on is the chemicals themselves and what they held. A lot of shops also get very focused, and actually they're painters as well, on this concept of dry. You know, thinking that the inside of a liner needs to be completely dry before it ends up into solid waste streams or a trash can or a dumpster or a landfill. And that's not really a defined term from the DPSC which regulates hazardous waste disposal in California, and the EPA, which is gonna regulate it throughout the rest of the country. We don't wanna focus on dry, instead what we wanna focus on is this concept of empty. And right from the regulation, you can see it on the screen there, when we're talking about contaminated containers, the regulation states any container or an inner liner of a container, which previously held a hazardous material, and which is empty, is exempt from the regulation. So from a shop standpoint, when I'm dealing with liners and paint cans and mixing cups and I want to dispose of them, if I am managing them to the empty standard, they are not hazardous. They are outside of the regulation and can be disposed of as solid waste. So the important thing is, when is a container empty, right? And so I've taken some pictures of some shops that I've gone in to kind of illustrate this point. But if I'm looking at a, a paint can or a a paint liner and I'm turning it upside down and pouring out the material, if I'm getting this continuous stream of liquid material, is that empty, right? When does it become empty to where it's no longer a part of the regulation and can be disposed of as a solid waste? Well, first what we have to do is go right back to the definition. How does a regulatory agency define when something is empty? And what they do is they break it down into two different categories of containers one that held a pourable material, which a good example of that's gonna be your paint cans and liners and gun wash and cleaning solvents, things like that. They're that pourable in their liquid form. And then containers that once held a not pourable material. So essentially it's gonna be like a body filler, um, seam sealer, those types of things. So when we're dealing with pourable chemicals inside of a container, it's empty when no hazardous material can be poured or drained from the container inner liner when it's held in any orientation. And no longer a continuous stream of material is coming from the opening. So in terms of shop terms, if I take a uh, leftover pint or quart of base coat and I tip it upside down and I rotate it in any direction, as long as a continuous stream of material does not come out of that container, it meets the definition of empty. So if I'm getting a little bit of drops that are happening because there's still a little bit of material in there, but it's drops and it's not stream, it's empty, right? Doesn't matter if I even hold the container upside down for 24 hours. If I get a single drop, that's empty because it's not producing a continuous stream of material. But if I go into one of your mix rooms and I go into the trash can and I pull out a, a paint liner and I flip it upside down and I get some type of continuous stream of material that looks like this, it does not meet the definition of empty. It is still a hazardous waste and would have to be handled as a hazardous waste. So if I was to find this into your trash can or in your dumpsters, it would be that illegal or improper 
disposal of a hazardous waste because that's a non-empty container, okay? So pourable material, I flip it upside down, I turn it in any direction, no continuous stream, it is not hazardous, it can go into solid waste or regular trash. If it's not a pourable material, right? So again, I'm not gonna be able to follow that same rule of holding it upside down and putting it in any direction because the material itself isn't pourable. So now the definition of empty is no hazardous material remains in or on the container that can be feasibly removed by physical me methods. And they have this additional um, item in there that says, which are commonly employed to remove materials. So they are not expecting you to take a container of body filler and pull out every single particular gram of material out of that. Um, they're not expecting you to have it go through this robust treatment process to get everything out of there. As long as you're following commonly employed methodologies to remove the material, and you end up not having this thick layer of encrusted material on the edge of the container or four ounces of material that have dried at the bottom because you didn't get it out of there soon enough, then it's gonna meet the empty definition. In fact, the regulation takes it one step further and says a thin layer of dried material or some type of a powder is considered acceptable. So if it's not a pourable material, the regulatory agencies understand that you're not gonna be able to get every single thing out of there. And they don't want you to rinse the containers with some type of solution or water to try to clean them, because then what are you doing with the water that's now been contaminated with the hazardous material? So what they want you to do is just follow commonly employed methodology to remove the materials, make sure you're doing it before it gets any type of thick buildup or encrusted material, uh, and then it's considered empty. So in terms of non-pourables, what would be a common method to remove the materials? Now, in the collision repair industry, as body shop owners and managers and painters have attempted to comply with these regulations, I've seen a lot of creative solutions to try to make sure their container is able to go into the trash and they don't have to handle it as a hazardous waste. So I've seen some shops and painters that will take leftover paint in paint liners and they'll put it in a window to let it dry out. And so that way the material on the inside becomes completely dry and it's no longer liquid form, right? That would be a violation. That would be something that is considered a couple of things. One, you're venting VOC materials out into the atmosphere, which could be a violation of your air quality permits in your local jurisdictions. You're also doing what's something known as treatment of hazardous waste that I'll get into in a little bit second, but essentially you're adding a step in trying to make something that is hazardous become non-hazardous, right? And it's also just not necessary. Again, dry is not the important term. What the important term is, is empty. So as long as I'm pouring everything out, even if there's a residual layer in there, it's gonna be okay because if it's pourable and I don't have that continuous stream, it can go into the trash. The other thing that I've seen is I've seen paint containers end up in the booth where they're trying to run it on a bake cycle and cure it um, to dry it again. I've seen uh, shops that'll take a white ball or a paper towel and they'll wipe the inside of a container to get all of the materials out of the paint liner or the paint can. Um, the problem with that is, what are you now doing with the paper towel that you've contaminated with paint, which is a hazardous waste? Now you have to deal with that waste stream. And as a container, it in and of itself is not inherently hazardous. So as long as we meet that empty standard, I don't need to wipe the interior surface down. So that would again be a, something that doesn't make practical sense. I've seen a shop take paint um, that's left over and they're going to use it uh, for basically spraying cardboard. Basically they, instead of painting a vehicle with it or using it for a ground coat, they take all the leftover paint and they paint it onto cardboard and then they cure it. And then they throw the cardboard into the trash. Again, this is a circumvention of hazardous waste rules and would be considered treatment and would be a violation. Okay. Now, if your facility has leftover paint in a liner and let's say it's red uh, and you're going to use it for the next vehicle that's coming in, let's say you're going to use it for a ground coat or for touch-ups, well, then that paint isn't a waste yet. It's not something you have to deal with. You just have to make sure that it's stored in the right way, meaning that the container is labeled and it's closed. 
right? And typically you're going to have a cabinet in your mix room or something like that where you'll keep those backup paint liners for touch-ups and ground coats. Perfectly fine. But as soon as your painter says, okay, I'm not going to use this anymore, that's when it becomes a waste and we have to deal with this by that material removal. Now, the last two items on the list are perfectly compl compliant and would be considered a common methodology. So if I um, have a can of body filler and I scrape the inside of it with the spreader um, to make sure that I'm, I'm removing all the buildup, I might have a thin uniform layer, no big deal, that's perfectly acceptable, but I scrape the inside of it just to make sure that I don't have any thick layers of body filler that harden. That's what's known as a common method and would be acceptable from a regulatory standpoint. If your painter makes a mistake and they catalyze clear coat, right, and it becomes hardened before they get a chance to pour it out, you can remove and chip out that catalyzed paint, and then the container itself can still be considered non-hazardous or solid waste. You would just need to make sure that the hardened paint that you remove from that container ends up in a hazardous waste drum. Dry paint and I see this a lot in shops, dry paint that has catalyzed is not safe to go into regular trash. That is illegal improper disposal of hazardous waste, okay? So letting materials intentionally catalyze and then putting the chipped out hockey pucks into regular trash would be a violation, okay? Those would need to go in uh, to a separate container and be disposed of as a hazardous waste solid. But the container that once held the chipped out materials would be considered non-hazardous. Now, what we were talking about with a couple of examples where we're letting something air dry um, or we're uh, spraying it on cardboard um, or we're putting it into the booth of, and, and baking it, that gets into that Cook's collision violation of this concept of treatment. So, Shops get to determine when something is a material versus when something is a waste. Ultimately, EPA, DTSC, regulatory agencies want you to use up and minimize your waste. And so there's regulations that are tied around waste. But if something is a material, meaning like the paint in the paint cans in your mix room, those aren't wastes. Therefore, they're not regulated as a waste by the EPA. Now you still have obligations for the fire department because it's flammable. You still have obligations for OSHA because it could combust. Those types of rules are in place and you have compliance concerns, but from a waste standpoint, it's a material and not something that's regulated yet. So in my example, where I'm saving red paint for a ground coat or a touch up, it's not a waste yet, it doesn't apply. But as soon as you guys have said, this material that's leftover paint is no longer gonna be used, Right? and your painter is making that decision on a daily basis when they're using up their material, it is now officially a hazardous waste. Once your shop has a hazardous waste, you are not licensed to treat it. Right? And treatment means converting it from hazardous waste to non-hazardous solid waste. Treatment also means incinerating it. Treatment basically means what the licensed waste haulers around the country are doing when they come and pick up your hazardous waste. So the safety cleans of the world, the Veolias of the world, the US Ecology, the Pacific Resources, the companies that are actually coming out there and picking up your drums, they're taking that to a disposal and treatment facility where they're doing processes to make it non-hazardous. They have licenses to treat. Body shops do not have licenses to treat. Therefore, drying it, in the booth, air drying it, um, adding some type of flocculant agent to mix in with water-based paint to solidify it. All of those different steps that a shop may take to convert something that's hazardous to non-hazardous is a violation because you don't have licenses to perform treatment. And those citations can be very, very expensive. The way to think of this is if you have liquid paint left over in a paint can or a paint liner, and you were able to wave a magic wand over it and turn it literally into water that you could drink, it is still a hazardous waste because you do not have the license to actually treat it at your facility and handle it in accordance. So once it becomes a hazardous waste at your shop, it is always a hazardous waste until you dispose of it 
with a hazardous waste hauler and disposal facility, okay? On the flip side of that, handling every container that paint comes into contact with, and a lot of shops have implemented this over the last two years, where they've been very concerned about protecting their businesses and controlling their liability, and they, they don't have a good handle on what they have to do or what their painters have to do, so they have a knee-jerk response where they just set up five, six, seven, 55-gallon drums throughout their shop, and they just handle everything as a hazardous waste. And there's two concerns there where it becomes very, very expensive. I mean, hazardous waste disposal from a 55-gallon drum standpoint, depending on your state, could be anywhere from $300 to $800, right? And if you're doing that every month, it's going to um, minimize pop profit and increase cost, right? So using an empty standard and training your people on how to make sure a container is empty, it only takes a few seconds. You're done with the liner, open the funnel, pour it out. As soon as the stream stops, throw that into the regular trash. If you use that, it can create tremendous cost savings for shops as an alternative to handling everything as hazardous. The second thing to consider when we're talking about handling everything as a hazardous waste is the EPA and DTSC are not trying to incentivize shops to do that. They don't want you to go to the lengths of disposing everything as hazardous because they're not looking to fill up hazardous waste landfills and hazardous waste storage areas faster with non-hazardous materials, things that are safe to go to a landfill. And to demonstrate this, we took it one step further. So we took paint liners that had come into contact with primer, base coat, and clear coat. And we met the empty standard, so we poured everything out, but there was still a wet, um, thin material that was on the inside of the liner and the inside of the can. And we sampled it and actually sent it to a laboratory to conduct what's known as STLC and TTLC testing. Basically, it's a methodology to determine if it, something is in fact hazardous or if it's non-hazardous can be safely disposed of um, into solid waste or the landfill. And for primer, base, and clear, all three containers came back with the testing methodology as non-hazardous. So even when we go above and beyond what the EPA is asking the shop to do, so even when we take an empty container and we get it tested, it's still coming back through the testing methodology as non-hazardous, right? So shops should be confident that if they're holding their painters accountable and holding their staff accountable to meet the empty standard, they're safely handling those waste streams and they can go into solid waste. Changing gears a little bit, paint containers has been the one that I've gotten the most questions from shops around the country. So I wanted to spend a lot of time on that to make sure that everybody's comfortable with it. But we also have other waste streams that the shops come into contact with that we have to deal with as well that have been tied in with some pretty significant penalties over the last couple of years in the industry. So aerosol cans is also considered a chemical container. And so empty rules are still going to apply. If you completely empty all of the contents of an aerosol can, it's gonna be a non-hazardous solid waste. It's gonna be able to go into regular trash in 95% of um, jurisdictions. There are a few pockets around the country where a city has a different requirement for aerosol cans. So what we do have to realize though is aerosol cans can be hazardous if a couple of things happen. One a spray mechanism becomes damaged or clogged and I can no longer spray the material outside of it. The propellant itself is exhausted and not working, but I still have liquid chemicals inside of the aerosol that I can feel when I shake up the container. Or if a technician just no longer wants to use the product, let's say he or she is spraying some type of material, it starts to sputter out on them and they can just go to the parts department and grab a new type of aerosol can well, and if they do that, there's still residual material in there. It is still hazardous. So what shops have to determine is, do you have confidence and trust in your technicians to handle aerosol cans that are damaged, clogged, or no longer spraying correctly, or they no longer want the material in the correct way? Because those are all hazardous, right? But if you do, and you know that every aerosol can is going to be emptied, then it can go into solid waste. Now, the first question that a lot of shops will ask is, well, do I need to buy a puncturing device? And there isn't a requirement from a body shop standpoint to buy a puncturing device that punctures the containers to be empty. 
Um, when we talk about empty of an aerosol can, basically if I shake the material up, turn it upside down and spray it, if nothing is sprayed from that aerosol can, no propellant, no chemical, if nothing is coming out of it, it's gonna be considered empty and it's a non-hazardous solid waste, okay? Moving on to shop dust. Um, this is one that uh, a lot of shops will struggle with, uh, but it's important to remember that your body fillers um, are considered a combustible dust depending on the types of materials that you're using. Um, if you're doing some type of feather edge sanding or you're sanding off the OE's paint, uh, when you're attempting to repair a dent or, or straighten a dent, um, or if we're doing any type of primer sanding, all of those materials produce a dust that can be combustible, and a shop has to do what's known as a hazardous waste determination. So there are customers of ours that have sampled their dust, sent it into a laboratory to have it tested, and confirmed as non-hazardous. Now, there are some concerns about sampling methodology because you're talking about dust. So shops shouldn't be sweeping up regular dust that you can find in your house and testing that. They should be sampling dust after a large sanding job where there's a lot of body filler dust and a lot of paint dust mixed in to test it. Um, that's very, very important is to get a sample that is representative of the waste stream. However, dust, it's been a 50-50 shot. Of the 40 or 50 um, tests that we've done in the last couple of years around the country for shops looking to determine this as non-hazardous, um, about half of them have failed. Um, they've either failed because they're still technically ignitable or they've failed because of zinc content or other types of hard metals. And therefore the dust is hazardous, which means it's gonna have to go into some type of a drum and be disposed of with a licensed waste hauler. If your shop has not made that determination, the first thing a regulatory agency is gonna ask you is, well, how do you know it's not hazardous? And you can't say, well, the manufacturer told me it was or the person that I bought it from told me it was. It's gotta be something that you're generating the waste, you have to do your due diligence. And now if you have determined it's hazardous waste, what are you then doing with DA paper that's come into contact with body filler and dust? Or if you're using some type of vacuum system that's collecting the dust, what are you doing with those vacuum bags? Most shops that have tested it and come back hazardous are just combining all of those materials with the dust into a drum to be disposed of with their waste hauler. So very, very important shops take the steps to know and can prove whether or not their body filler and paint dust is considered a hazardous waste stream. Um, finally, batteries, electronics, and bulbs. Um, this is something that um, every shop comes into contact with at some point. It's just not a day-to-day -day waste stream for you. Um, things like household batteries have acid and lead and nickel in them, and that's considered a hazardous waste. We don't want those to go into the landfill. Your electronics and circuits uh, all have lead and mercury and cadmium in them. Anything with a circuit board in it is going to be considered hazardous. And then fluorescent bulbs coming out of a paint booth have mercury. Um, High-intensity lights have xenon in them. Uh, LED lights, headlamps have circuits, zinc, and chromium, so there's also mercury and things like that in there. Those are all considered hazardous. Now, the EPA has um, allowed these types of hazardous waste to be handled instead as a universal waste. And a universal waste, basically, is the EPA say, way of saying, look, it's not stuff that we want in the landfill, but it's not as immediately dangerous to public health as liquid paint um, or something that would be immediately flammable. So that allows a shop to put it into a container, label it, and keep it for up to a year. Um, there are also looser restrictions on manifesting and training and some other things for universal waste. But the important thing is to take the steps to make sure that your technicians aren't just throwing this stuff in the trash. Um, we don't want to be doing some type of disassembly, removing a headlamp that has some type of a, an LED or some type of a bulb that, that has hazardous properties to it, and they just throw that into the dumpster, and then now the shop has liability because you've disposed of universal waste illegally or improperly. So very important that we are communicating with your waste haulers uh, to deal with these waste streams. A lot of times maybe you'll set up like a five gallon bucket for batteries. You might have a box that you're reusing for the fluorescent bulbs when you're doing a paint booth light bulb change out. Um, you know, there's creative ways to containerize these things. They don't need to go into a drum, but we do wanna make sure the technicians aren't just putting them into the trash. And then real quick on oil filters, 
Um, this is a key thing to differentiate. California rules are a little bit different. So just, you know, I know that the shops on the call are not making it routine practice to do oil changes. But if you do have an oil filter, that's also considered a, a container. Has to be drained of, you know, free flowing oil. If there's a flapper valve or something like that, it's got to be opened or punctured so there's no residual oil inside of it. I know shops aren't producing a ton of oil filters, so you can have a bucket, keep it as drained used oil filters and, and have it up for a year. Um, and then it's going to be recycled for scrap metal with like a licensed waste hauler. Most of your waste haulers will have a pretty simple oil filter program because it's not a high volume thing for you guys. We just don't want these things to end up in the trash. Now, if you're in California and you come across a paper oil filter, in the regulation it says that the only way they're not hazardous waste is if they're recycled for scrap metal. Because paper oil filters cannot be used for scrap metal, it's always a hazardous waste and has to be put in its own container. So you can't combine steel oil filters and paper oil filters in California, okay? So besides waste disposal, treatment, container enforcement issues, we also have some things that I think is important for you guys to be aware of um, that have changed in the regulatory environment. The first one is tied in with data. Um, OSHA and EPA are starting to um, be a bit more aggressive about getting data from businesses uh, to identify enforcement actions and businesses that they need to inspect and that sort of thing. Your OSHA 300 logs is an annual requirement that's going to be coming up here in a couple of weeks for you guys on the call, um, where you document the number of employees, how many hours they worked, how many injuries you had, how many days they missed work. Um, if you had any major things like amputations or loss of eye, all of that gets put on a form known as an OSHA 300. Now, historically, OSHA 300s just had to be posted in the break room from February 1st to April 30th, and then the, there's a five-year record-keeping requirement. What's being changed is that data is now being asked to be submitted electronically into OSHA every year. Now we're in a staggered phase in, so the people on this call that are a body shop, it doesn't apply to you just yet. It's for businesses that are very large, over 250 employees, or what's known as high risk industries, things like logging and that sort of thing. However, the intention for OSHA is over the next several years to phase this in to affect more and more businesses. So at a certain point, OSHA will require the collision repair industry to provide OSHA 300 logs documenting your injuries, even if they're minor, to OSHA on an annual basis, which is gonna create opportunities for potential inspections. In terms of the EPA, they've launched the cross-media electronic reporting rule. And basically the EPA covers air emissions and water and waste and a lot of different things that are gonna be broken up into a lot of different little agencies. And what they're looking to do is basically cross-share data from the air agency, with the wastewater agency, with the waste department, with the fire department, so that everyone is on the same page with what business is there, what are they doing, and is there possibly an issue with what they, um, if they're being compliant, to where they might want to conduct joint inspections or share observations that they saw on other inspections with the other agencies that are under the EPA umbrella. So data, very, very important. Uh, around the country, here's the, um, this is about a year old now, but here's the approval progress of Cromare as it's rolling out across the country. You're seeing 80 plus percent um, rollout um, for a lot of the green around the country. So those are going to be where the EPA has this up and running and they're already beginning the data sharing uh, process. So definitely keep your eye on that as this progresses. In addition, in 2015, the Adjustment Act was passed. Basically, it was a one-time catch-up provision. Uh, to adjust the penalties that businesses can incur because of changes in inflation. Um, they also built into it an annual increase of penalties based on inflation. So every single year the penalties go up. Uh, the Adjustment Act for OSHA changed serious citations from $7,000 to $12,000. And they changed repeat or willful from $70,000 to $125,000. So big, big increases. And the thought process behind it is we need to increase the penalties to make sure that businesses are paying attention to this. And if they are doing something that they shouldn't, that it is significant enough to get them to change their behavior. So basically, if we're, if we're sending you a bill for $12,000, more than likely, it's going to be something that the business will take seriously and make sure that they don't repeat the mistake. Uh, from an EPA standpoint, if you look at the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, all of those went up tremendously. 
Um, also, fourth one down is RICRA, which is that waste that we were talking about, which is, you know, from five to $25,000 in penalties. Now we're going from 14 to almost $100,000 in penalties. Um, this is a couple of years old when the Adjustment Act passed, so they're even higher nowadays because of that annual increase. So penalties are bigger, um, more data out there. Very, very important that shops um, have a policy and a program in place. The uh, last regulatory thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about is just a reminder, um, the EPA regulation known as 6H NESHAP, which deals with hazardous air pollutants, it went into effect uh, back in 2012. There was a five-year requirement for painter certification. So any painter, anyone that's handling a spray gun, even a body technician that's doing some type of a cut-in needs to go through painter certification to meet the 6H requirements if you're subject to this regulation. Um, so a lot of your staff are probably expired or expiring if you haven't done that training. And just as a reminder, this is gonna create some inspection opportunities for the local jurisdictions that handle air emissions. There's four pieces of documentation that every shop must have on file. Um, one is the painter training that we talked about. Uh, two is certification and proof of delivery of you know, your registration with the EPA, basically whether or not you're um, compliant with 6H or exempt, um, and then booth filter capture efficiency, which looks like the picture on the screen, basically documentation from the manufacturer of the filters that they're able to capture over 98% of the particulates, and then spray gun transfer efficiency. So depending on what spray guns you guys are using, I'm assuming HVLP, it has to document more than 65%. Um, there's already a webinar up there um, with the impact performance and the RDA group on 6H NESHAP. So if you want more information on this, um, you can find that on their uh, YouTube page. There's a lot of more details around 6 h and eShap. Finally, um, I just want to remind you guys, I'm sure you have um, uh, hopefully participated in some webinars before, so you know a little bit about me and about us, um, but we are certainly here to help. Um, we are the largest environmental health and safety company dedicated to the collision repair industry. Uh, we have expert team members on staff that can help you with permitting, licensing issues, interpretation of regulations, inspections that may come up, um, any of your chemical inventories, those types of things. And we take a big, big focus on making sure we're educating the industry as new regulations come out. So you could see some of the things that we've been involved in and webinars that we've done historically with RDA and Impact. We also have, as I said, a network of compliance coordinators. These are safety professionals that work for GMG and Virusafe around the country where we will come into your business and conduct quarterly safety and environmental inspections. We'll conduct training with your uh, technicians and painters, implement a monthly safety meeting process, build out all of your required compliance documentation. Our service is called the Compliance Department. The idea is that we're gonna do this for you guys, uh, give you a resource and really drive the bus for you to help get you that peace of mind. And then we also have a ton of technology available at your fingertips, a portal where you can access all of your compliance record keeping, uh, assessment reports, KPIs to benchmark your shop and handle all the online training for your technicians. Uh, big question I get, just kind of ballpark, what is it cost to add our services to my shop? Uh, depending on the size of your facility and how frequently you want us to come out to your business, that's gonna range anywhere from 49 to $299 per month. Most of our clients are in a quarterly type program, which is gonna be more around $199 per month. If you'd like more information about this presentation, about our services, if you have any questions in general about OSHA, EPA, DOT, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address and direct phone number is on the screen. I am here to help, and I will pause there to see. Melissa, did we get any questions from the audience? Um, we don't have any yet, um, but if anybody has, uh, please go ahead and type it in. And I will follow up with everybody who's on the call as well and send them your contact information. So if they do have questions, they can reach out to you. Fantastic, thank you. So with that, I don't see anybody sending anything. Um, I think we'll I think we'll end it here. I wanna thank everyone for um, participating. Um, I wish everyone happy holidays. Thanks Brandon for taking time out and uh, talking to our salespeople and shops. And um, we look forward to future uh, training webinars and uh, keep sending us your suggestions. Thanks everyone, take care. Thanks Brandon. Thank you. Bye-bye.